All right, let's pray and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, now as we come to your word and we trust as it tells us that it's living and active, able to penetrate even our thoughts and our intentions and our very souls. And so we ask you, Jesus, the living word, to speak to us through your written word in your name. Amen. Uh, how, how many of you have ever witnessed a miracle? Show of hands. Who's witnessed a miracle? Some of you are like, ah, where's this going? I'm not sure about this, right? I don't mean you prayed for a parking spot and the one right in front opened up. It's a miracle. I don't mean that, right? I mean a, a genuine, unexplainable event outside of God's intervention. This is miraculous. Anybody ever had an experience like that? Some of you aren't so sure, maybe, and not, haven't put your hands up. Um, and I'm not saying that you should have. Although if you trust in Christ and you know you're the forgiveness of your sins, if you know he's washed you clean, that's miracle enough, isn't it? And we'll get to that later. Um, years ago when I was in Russia with a group from our church, um, the closest I've probably come personally, although I've talked to lots of people who have, have seen God's miraculous hand intervene in lots of ways, and I've been a part of lots of relational healings that are miraculous, freedom from addiction that's miraculous, but in terms of physical miracle, I was uh, in Russia with a, a pastor there that we were helping support this church. And we were doing some hospice visits for a group of people the church supported who were, they were, they were on their last days. We are going bed to bed. And I was just listening and they're praying in Russia, Russian and I didn't know anybody, but I'm just there with them, put my hands on when they told me to. And, and then the pastor turned to me and said, you pray for this woman. She hasn't had her eyes open, he said, in weeks. She's just on, just hanging on there, on breathing. We know her, we love her, Let's, will you pray for her? And I'll, I'll translate, he said. Like, she, she's not even coherent, but okay. So I prayed. And then he would translate. Our hands were on the woman's forearms. And I know this is going to sound strange to you, but I felt my hands get warm. And I opened my eyes in the middle of my prayer, which is not cheating. It's okay to do that, by the way. And the woman opened her eyes. She hadn't been, she hadn't been consciously awake in weeks, he said. She opened her eyes. She looked at the pastor, and there was a light of recognition in her, in her eyes. She smiled at him, spoke his name, Victor. And then he, he began to weep. And we prayed for her, and she passed. And I, I, that was probably the closest I've come to seeing that. We're going to be looking at such an account, not that exactly, but a physical miracle in the book of Acts. Before we get there, I, I want to make sure you understand that while the, the story that we're going to look at is miraculous, is astounding, and is at the center of the, of the text, it's not in and of itself the heart of the story. I'll explain as we go. We are in a series, a year-long series in the book of Acts, finishing now our first part of this series called Beginnings, Reaching the World, the first three chapters of the book of Acts. This is the story of how the church got started, of how a group of 120 confused and nervous individuals who trusted Jesus and the Holy Spirit came upon them and God began to do miraculous things in their midst and change the world. It's really the story of our roots as well as the church today. It's how they engage their world for the gospel. It's a story of what God did and through his Holy Spirit in their lives. And it's a story of what is still going on today through God's people in the world. Last week we looked at what the early Christians did. Once the, the Spirit came on them, they spoke the wonders of God in different earthly languages. People were amazed and Peter gave an incredible sermon and 3,000 were converted. And then what they do? They gathered together. We studied last week, Pastor Brian preached to you about the early community. What did they gave themselves to? They gave their lives to each other and to God in their midst. Now we turn to Acts chapter 3 and we look at, okay, coming out of that community. Last week was a description of how they loved each other, served each other in community. This is a story about how they engaged the world outside of them. If you have your Bible open to Acts chapter 3, or follow with me, I'll read from mine. We see on the screens as well. Verses 1 through 16. We'll look at the whole chapter in general, but this, these 16 verses just for now. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called Be the Beautiful Gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms, and Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold. But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, 
asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us? As though by our own power or piety, we have made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in, and, and his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. We will stop there for now. This is an incredible story. I get excited reading it. I hope you do as well. Peter and John are, are, are now facing the world as it is in all of its brokenness. This is always the business of God's people. Not just like last week to huddle up and care for each other, but also to go out into the world as, as messed up and broken as it is and to engage the people they find in it with the hope that they have. That's what's going on here in, in, from a 10,000 foot view. We carry on the ministry of Jesus. Jesus himself said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it is the sick. I came not to seek the righteous, but sinners. To seek and save that which was lost. The irony in his statement is we're all sick spiritually. There are no healthy people, just those who think they are. So uh, uh, we carry on his ministry as his people in the world. Now this encounter with the lame beggar, as I said, is the center of the, the text, but it's not the central point, not in and of itself anyway. The physical healing points to something else. This is always the case, by the way, with miracles in the New Testament. How many of you know somebody who has a hard time with all the miracles in the Bible? And maybe that somebody is you. Anybody know someone like that? Well, you read this stuff and you think, ah, it's hard to swallow all this stuff, the supernatural stuff. What if it was just boiled down to the lessons? I could handle that better. Let me help you. The, the miracle here is pointing to something else. That's always the case with the miracles in the New Testament. Let's set the context here before we get into that. Peter and John are going to the temple at the ninth hour. Anybody know what time that was? That's roughly three o'clock in the afternoon. There were uh, hours of Jewish, the Jewish day was divided into, into hours. There were three major hours for sacrifice and prayer, 9 a.m., noon, and 3 p.m. They're going up to the temple at the ninth hour. That's three o'clock in the afternoon. Why the temple? Well, they're Jews. Peter and John are Jews. They're, Jesus did not come to tell them, Change your religion, he fulfilled it. Matthew 5, he says, I came not to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. Peter and John are doing what they always did. They're just doing it now in light of what Christ has done. They're going to the temple at the time of prayer. And on the way, while they're walking in, they see this guy being carried. That's important. He's being carried, and he's being carried every day, we know, to be laid down to beg at the beautiful gate. You'll see here an image, I think, yeah. This is a mock-up of the temple. There's the beautiful gate. Right inside that gate is called the Court of Women because women were not allowed to go any further. Um, you know, they had issues in those days. Um, the, in the large, tall building in the back there, that's the Holy of Holies, uh, the, most, uh, the, the most holy place where the sacrifices, uh, the, the high priest went once per year. The altar is just inside that second gate. So he's right at this gate, the beautiful gate. It's a prime spot to ask for alms. That's where everybody was going. Peter and John, like the rest, are headed up there because it's almost 3 o'clock time for prayer. And when they're going in, they see this guy being carried and placed in his daily spot. Now, Peter and John were Jews. They had been in the temple many, many times before. It's not unreasonable. In fact, it's likely they'd seen this guy before. He's there every day. The people all recognized him as the one at the beautiful gate. Oh, that's that guy who's at the beautiful gate every day. But this time... Something different happens. I was thinking about this just, just, just this week. This time they stop, they engage him. Peter says, look at us. How many of you walking down the Michigan Avenue, if you've ever been in downtown Chicago, and you see someone uh, begging, stop and say, look at me. My guess is most of you don't. You avoid the eye contact. Maybe you cross the street. You don't look at people in need because it's awkward. It's uncomfortable. We're not sure what to do about it. Oh, don't look at me. Don't ask me. Don't ask me for money. Don't tell me a story that I don't believe. I'm just going to keep walking, right? Peter stops and engages this guy. I think at least one lesson here is this. The gospel changes the way you see the world and the people in it. Peter and John aren't the same guys anymore. 
They've been with Jesus. The Holy Spirit is coming to their lives. They've walked by this guy how many times? And now this time, they stop. Look at us. We'll come back to that. The gospel changes the way that we see people and see the world. What do we know about this guy? Um, first of all, in verse 2, he's here every day. He's there every day. Second, in verse 10, he's known by all the people. They know him. They recognize him as that guy at the beautiful gate. In, in chapter 4, verse 22, we find out he was in his 40s. He's nearly 40 years old. And in verse 2 again of chapter 3, he's been lame since birth. He's been that way since birth. They carry him there every day. Everybody knows him. He's in his 40s. This has been going on for a while, in other words. He was probably carried there those three times a day, nine, noon, and three. Probably by his family, likely, because he's, if he's not from a wealthy family, this is the only thing he can do to help earn any money or any income. There were no social welfare programs in the government or the social system for people in his condition. In fact, in the ancient world, there was a kind of unofficial system of begging and asking for alms and giving of alms that amounted to a welfare system for people like this. It was not unexpected. It was not inconvenient. They were, it was normal for them to be there. And this is what he can do. So his family members or friends bring him, drop him off at the three major times for prayer and sacrifice. He begs. They pick him up, take him home, give him the money to the, you know, to the family, and they put him back again. That's his life day after day. Additionally, the fact that he was born in that condition carried a kind of spiritual stigma with it. It was likely believed that it was the punishment for his parents' sin, that he's born that way. In fact, you might remember in John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, Jesus heals a man born blind, and the people ask, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born this way? Jesus has a very different view. He says, neither, but this happened so that you would know the power of God. It takes a totally different view of miracles. Um, let's look at um, what miracles are and what they are for. You'll see two questions here. What, miracles, what are miracles and what are they for? I think we've already talked about what they are. The, the, the undeniable, miraculous intervention of, of God or something supernatural in the world. In the introduction to his book, The Screwtape Letters, C.S. Lewis says that people tend to uh, believe in demons either not at all or too much. He's writing about the demonic spiritual powers in the world. He says two mistakes we make is either to believe not at all in them, totally skeptical and dismissive of all supernatural, or we believe in them too much, a demon behind every rock. I think the same thing can be said about when it comes to miracles. I think Christians that I talk to fall off on one side or the other. Either we disbelieve, we're skeptical about the supernatural stuff, we, we disbelieve in the miracles, or... We believe in them too much. And here's what I mean by that. We make the actual miracle the center of our faith. We almost demand we need to have some sort of sign to validate our faith. Both are mistakes. Many people say miracles are impossible. Only the simple-minded and foolish believe in such things. Or those who say, you know, a miracle, they see a miracle behind every occurrence of their life. And that somehow validates what they believe. I would say this. If you disbelieve in miracles entirely then you really can't be a Christian. It's impossible for to disbelieve in the, in the existence of miracles or the possibility of them and call yourself a Christian. Because at the very center of our faith is what C.S. Lewis called the grand miracle in his book, Miracles, by the way, that God became a human baby, that a virgin gave birth, that he lived a sinless life, died on a Roman cross and rose bodily, physically in the flesh, from the grave and ascended to heaven. That's a miracle. And if you say, oh, you know, I, I believe in Jesus and his teachings and I accept that God exists, but I just don't believe in all the miracles, I think you, it's impossible to be a Christian and not hold out the belief that God can do the miraculous. On the other hand, I know many Christians who seem to make miracles in their life kind of a validation of their faith. So what are miracles for? Uh, they're meant to be signs. They're point to something beyond themselves. They are meant not just to wow us, but to teach us, to convey some truth to us. I'm going to give you a grid, a uh, three-part grid to understanding miracles in the Bible and in our lives. And I, I adapted this from Timothy Keller in one of his, a, a sermon that I read of his, where I think it's very, he's a pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City. And so I want to give him credit for this, but um, he, he helps us with this, that miracles point upward they point forward, and they point inward. We'll talk about those each in turn. What does he mean? First, miracles point upward. Simply put, it points not to the manifestation itself, the thing itself. It points to the one who did it. It points to God. God did this. That's all over the text, by the way, isn't it? 
praising God, undeniable. Peter says it, the, the man himself says it. In fact, in, 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 in verse 6 of chapter 3, he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And then later when he's defending what he did, people are questioning, they want to know what's going on. He says, don't look at us like we did this. This came from God. In verse 9 of the text, and all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him. They saw him. They saw what, he, what had happened to him, what was going on. In other words, the miracle is an accreditation. It's, it's an affirmation that these people and their message is indeed from God. I've heard people say things, well, I can't believe in miracles because they violate the laws of nature. I talked to a young man years ago who was a brilliant student and scholar, and he said, look, I've just... I've been studying, I've been in college now, and I really can't handle miracles because I know I've been studying in physics the laws of nature, and these miracles violate the laws of nature, and so the Bible's inconsistent that way. But if God designed the universe and its laws, I think we're better, we, we'd be, we would do better to call them not the laws of nature, but the laws of God operating in the world, then God must be above them, must be beyond them is not bound by them if he invented them. In fact, the so-called laws of nature are simply God's customary way of operating. So take healing, for example. Perhaps we could think of it this way. God's ordinary way of healing people when he does is through modern medicine, through treatment, the way that would be the study of the human body and how we respond to treatment and, we, and we're treated. It's not too far of a stretch to say that what goes on in medicine today is miraculous compared to 100 years ago. But God could, should he choose to, circumvent that and operate faster or in a different way than he ordinarily does. He's not bound by these laws. So if you're a person, let me put it this way. I don't know all of you here, but if you're somebody who this is an issue for, even a believer, or if you're kind of a skeptic and seeking to understand God and to know Christianity, don't get hung up on some philosophical objection to the possibility of miracles. What you need to do is start with Jesus. Who was he? What did he claim about himself? What are the claims he makes about himself in the New Testament? How, what's the evidence for his resurrection? Look at his life. Look at his character. Look at his love and his humility and his sacrifice and what he said and what he did. That's where you discover the truth of Christianity. All right, anyway. This is precisely what Peter does in his sermon that follows this miracle. He uses this miracle to point to the great miracle, the resurrection. Look at verses 12 and through 16 again. He said, when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we made him walk? Like this is, you're missing the point here. Then he says, verse 13, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, he's speaking to the Jews, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate. This sermon is, is remarkably similar to one he gave just one chapter earlier, isn't it? This Jesus whom you crucified. He's not shy about saying that. But Peter here is pointing upward. He's saying what you see here on earth is not about this thing. It's about the one who caused it to happen, his power. I remember years ago a guy who was attending our church with his wife and she was really excited that he meet with me. I don't think he was that excited. And so I encouraged her to have him call me. And he never did. But every time she'd see me, oh, I just, I know he wants to get together with you. I'm like, well, I don't, I mean, it's a phantom, your husband. I've never seen him anyway. I don't want to call him. So if I finally I did to appease her and he was like, oh, the pastor's calling. I can just hear it through the phone on his voice. Anyway, uh, we, we got together and he's a nice guy. He said, look, I, I think it's great that my kids are involved. I think it's fantastic that my wife is, 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 has a community and all this. And I'll go occasionally with her. But look, I don't really have a need for all this. I said, okay, I understand that. And we talked a bit. And he said, look, I, he was, and then at the end of our, our, our coffee, he said, I might be, believe in Christianity if someone, or he didn't say if someone, if I could ever find a watertight argument. But I never have. I didn't say this to him because I was, didn't think of it at the time. I emailed him later and I said, you know, I've been thinking about what you said. You're right, God has not given you or us a watertight argument. He doesn't do that. He's given you a watertight person against whom there is no argument if you really understand him. I'd like to say that, my, that, that just changed his life. I, I hadn't heard from him. But that's the fact. Oh, if I could have the perfect explanation, the watertight argument, answer all my questions, then I'd believe. That's not what God gives us. He gives us a person against whom there can be no argument. 
So miracles always point upward. They always point to the reality and the power of God. Second, they point forward. This is really interesting. Pay careful attention to the way Luke describes the reaction of the lame man after he's healed. I'll read it again. Peter looks at it and says, look at us. The guy looks at them. He's expecting to get something, right? Peter says, I don't have silver or gold. I love the, the old King James, silver and gold have I none. But what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. He takes him by the hand and he lifts him up. By the right hand raises him up. And immediately his feet and ankles became strong. And verse 8. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. So do you get the picture? He didn't, like, a, like Bambi, kind of go, oh, I can walk, you know, and stumble around. He jumped to his feet. He's leaping up and down. He has not walked ever. And in an instant, this guy is, so, so I, I want you to, if, if, if you're skeptical, I'm trying to press on that now. Um, he, he didn't, it wasn't like this guy was a, it was a slow healing. It was an instantaneous, jump to your feet, leap up and down, shout, because that's what you do if you've been 40 years lame, and you can walk, you can leap, and you can run, praising God. Nobody who saw this going on, or read it in the early church, would have missed the connection to an Old Testament prophecy here. Isaiah chapter 35. You can turn there if you want to in your Bibles. It's not on the screen. Isaiah 35. Verses 5 and 6. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the mute praise God. This is, by the way, in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus said this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is what he came to do. This is what Peter is talking about in chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. We didn't read this in, in, in the outset, but I'll read it for you now. Peter then launches into, after explaining this is Jesus, he launches into this, this amazing sort of explanation, theological explanation of what's really going on here, what it all points to. Listen to verses 19 through 21. Or verse 18. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which was spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. He's referring to Isaiah 35. He says, heaven holds Jesus until the time for restoring all things comes. Here's what Peter's saying. This miracle in the moment here points to the reality of God at all times. It also points forward to what God will do someday. Jesus, who did, who's in, in whose name this happened, is going to come back and restore all things. This is just a taste of what's to come. This is just a glimpse of God's restoring power when he comes back. That's what Peter's saying here. That's how the miracle always points forward. They always have to do. Do you, do you notice that miracles in the Bible are never a show? They're never like just raw displays of power. Do you ever notice that there's no skywriting going on? Like if I had miraculous power through Jesus, I'd be going, I'd just do crazy stuff that people would believe, right? Don't you ever think that? If God could just show me some tangible way. Why don't the disciples just fly around? Why, not, why, didn't, why didn't they just zoom all over the place like Superman? They don't, it's not about the raw display of power. Miracles almost always have to do with other people and alleviating their suffering, meeting their needs, touching them in some way. They're pointing forward. They're not just raw displays of power to shock us, to wow us, to entertain us. They're not tricks. They're pointing forward to what God will do someday. In this sense, miracles are not suspensions of the natural order. They're restorations of it. Think about it. We live in a world from Genesis 3 on that's been broken by sin, that's corrupted, that is not right. Illness, disease, uh, evil, mistreatment, oppression, injustice, poverty, war, on and on it goes. It's not as it's supposed to be. That's unnatural in terms of how God created it to be. So miracles are not breaks in the natural order. Actually, theologically... They're natural acts in an unnaturally broken world. They're glimpses of how God intended it to be and how it will be someday when he restores it. So they're not, 
They're not suspensions of the natural order, they're restorations of it. Miracles show that God is an enemy of suffering, and someday he's going to remove it completely. And we, so far as we can, living for him in this life, should be enemies of suffering and injustice and evil as well. Isaac Watts wrote this great hymn, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. This last line is Isaiah 35. Not the last line, but one of the key verses. My favorite in all the hymn is, Hear him, ye deaf, his praise, ye dumb, your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold, your Savior comes, and leap, ye lame, for joy. This is Isaiah 35. It's what's happening in Acts 3. So do you grasp this incredible hope this holds out for us as Christ followers? This is, by the way, and I know some of you have recently, are currently, or will someday undergo your own suffering, your own pain for those that you love. How do we endure it? In 1 Thessalonians 4, we do not grieve like those who have no hope. What's our hope? That it's not the final word. That, that it points to what's to come. When we read about these miracles in the New Testament, they are saying God is real. This is his power on display. And they point forward to someday this is just a taste of Revelation 21. When every tear is wiped dry. There's no more death or dying. No more crying. No more pain. No more lameness. No more hurt paralysis. No more cancer eating away bodies. All of it will be gone and restored. That's our hope. So they point upward, they point in, forward, and lastly, they point inward. This may be the most important. They point inward spiritually into our own hearts. This miracle is really a picture of the gospel. Not only is this beggar a real flesh and blood person who really did have his legs healed and walk around praising God and leap praising God, he symbolizes in a powerful way the human condition apart from Christ. He's lame, paralyzed since birth. Born that way, in other words. The Bible says we're born into sin, every one of us. It's a spiritual paralysis, if you will, and we are totally powerless to fix our own condition. We cannot fix our sin problem any more than he could fix his own lameness. Can't do anything about it. We don't even know what we need. Do you notice in verses 3 and 4, the guy looks at them expecting to get something from them. Did you catch that? What's he expecting to get? What do you think? Alms. Silver. Money. A little something to help alleviate my suffering for me and my family to get by in this life. He doesn't even know what he needs really or what is possible. That's our spiritual condition. We're spiritually broken and paralyzed. We can't fix ourselves, and we don't even know what we need. And we look to the world for the wrong stuff. Silver and gold. What the world can give us. And it can never fix our problem. This, by the way, this, this story is directly reminiscent of a story in Luke chapter 5. This is the story, <coughs> excuse me, of the paralytic. Remember the story that Jesus is speaking to a bunch of people and the, the roof is uh, being torn apart and they lower this guy down on a mat. Do you remember the story? And they lower him down. I, mean, I mentioned being the guy, like, what, you sure hope your friends have, are even with the ropes, right? Or, or, or you can't do anything about it, right? And then he comes right to Jesus' feet. He's laying there. He can't move. He's like, oh, my friends, I don't, I'm sorry. I apologize for the interruption, Jesus, you know. He's laying there. And Jesus looks at him. There's a crowd around. That's why they lowered him to the roof because they couldn't get in. And what does Jesus say to him? What's the first thing he says? I tell you, your sins are forgiven. I imagine being that guy going, well, gee, thanks, but not really what I'm here for. <laughs> I've got a more pressing issue. <laughs> I can't walk, you know. If you could do something about that, Jesus. I mean, thanks for, you know, the sins. That's nice, but. And then the people in the crowd, the teachers of the law, they murmur to each other. Who does he think he is for giving sins? And Jesus says an amazing thing. He, he knows they're murmuring. And he turns to them, not the man. And he says to them, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I tell you, rise. And the guy does. It, it, it can't be any more clear what the miracle is for. It's pointing to something else. It's not about, we think our biggest issue is physical. If, if I had this bill paid, if I had this disease under control, if I could walk, no. Oh, but I, what I really need is to walk. And Jesus is saying to us in a sense, no, you don't. That's not what you really need. That will not really bring you happiness. What you need is to have your sins forgiven. What you need to have is have your heart cleansed. I'm gonna, I'll heal you, but the real healing is in here. Pastor Roger, 
dear friend, many of you know and loved him, he's with Jesus now and he's leaping and he's praising. He used to say when he was first diagnosed, I may not be cured, but I was healed a long time ago. That touch, touched me. I remember that ever since. I'm sure he got it somewhere, but it's profound for me. He's right. I may not be cured of the, of the many cancers that were ravaging his physical body, but I was healed a long time ago by Jesus. What, I, what he really needed, he already had. We need to recognize. I, I think it's very common for us to read this story, and I've done this and I've made this mistake, to preach it, to read it, to see it, and to identify ourselves with Peter and John, right? We, we the children of God in the world, should be offering to people Christ. And we should, of course we should. We should be meeting the broken needs of people in the world. Yes, of course we should. We should not, I mean, silver and gold we may have, we may not have, what we have is Jesus. That's what we should be taking to people. Yes, agreed. But the, the most profound way for us to read this story is not to see ourselves as Peter and John, but to see ourselves as the lame beggar. Do you hear that? Do you see yourself that way? You are the spiritually paralyzed one. You are the one who doesn't even know what you need. The gospel is offered to you, and it's far beyond what you can imagine. You're looking in the world. We're looking out in the world for a little help to get by in life. We have no concept of what Christ can do in our hearts if we trust him. Verse 19, Peter tells us what is most needed. He says, repent. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. That word is churchy, I know, repent. Repent. Sounds very Baptist-y, pastor-y thing to say. You know, it, it literally means what he says next, and turn back. It's not a negative term, it's a, it's a beautiful term. Turn back. Turn away from the direction you're going and turn to the only one who offers you what you really need. You're looking in the world for stuff that can't fix your problem. At best, it can just anesthetize it for a while, make you feel okay for a while, but it will never cure you. It will never heal you. It will never fix what's really wrong in your heart. So repent. Turn back. This is the starting point for knowing Jesus, to repent. And friends, I think it's also the place we must always return to as his children. We drift away from a realization that apart from Christ, I'm that beggar. I am that beggar. Robert Coleman in his book, The Master Plan of Evangelism, says uh, Christians are just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread, the bread of life. I, don't, I think in our culture it's, it's hard. We, it, I, think it's, I think many of you, you come to church every week. You, you, you're very involved. You even give some and you serve some. You even know your Bible a little bit. But you have never repented. You've never turned around, really, from the direction of your heart and life where it's headed. You're trying to add on some Christianity to help you get a buy in life. Peter says, silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Get up, walk. First you have to repent. I know in my heart some of you here haven't done that. You think you have. You think it's okay. But you've never turned to him. You've never seen yourself as the beggar. That's the foundation. That's the starting place to have a relationship with Jesus. 